uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, also on behalf of the future sketches group of the MIT Media Lab, uh, I wanna thank you. Um, I also wanna thank Zach Lieberman, who is the, the uh, PI of our group, um, the people, the members of our group, and uh, also our amazing uh, speaker today, Ari Melanciano. Um, so uh, we've been organizing these lunch lectures and uh, this series is about uh, gen generative AI and artistic practice. Um, so our group at the MIT Media Lab basically explores software as a medium for art and design, um, as well as toolkits and pedagogical approaches to learning code. And um, we've really uh, seen that recently generative AI has advanced exponentially and has made like really big uh, waves. Um, and that has raised many questions for us uh, in the group. And because of that, we, yeah, we thought um, we don't have all the answers and we actually are really curious to see what artists are doing with this and how they're approaching uh, this yeah, new field and this super quickly uh, developing field. So um, that's kind of the outline of, uh, of this series. Um, we will be recording this. So I make sure if you uh, don't want to be recorded to mute and, uh, Put off your camera. Um, that also means that you'll be able to uh, watch the series back again. Um, yeah, so that is a little bit of the outline. Um, what we'll have today, so if you have any questions, like feel free to post them in the chat. Um, today we have Ari Melanciano with us, and I'm really excited about her because I really love her work. Um, so she's going to talk about her uh, art and research uh, practice. Uh, that yeah, it explores a lot of things. Um, it's basically like computational anthropology. Um, she explores uh, speculative design and kind of how the ethnographical morphing of artistic expression across the diasporas. Um, she's also looking at mythology and rituals and how they uh, are formed and embodied. Um, and yeah, she makes really, really interesting projects. Um, and she also currently teaches um, on uh, at Parsons and NYU uh, and also in the New School in New York, um, mostly courses on emerging technologies like AI, uh, but also art and design. Um, and before that, she used to work at Google Creative Lab and she's the founder of Afrotectopia, which is a cultural institution that is researching and imagining um, yeah, new media arts, uh, design, science, but also through a black and Afrocentric uh, centric lens. So yeah, she's doing a lot of really, really interesting work and we're really excited uh, to hear uh, about her artistic practice uh, today and how um, it involves generative AI. So please give her a warm welcome, Ari Melanciano. I will imagine the applause. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's exciting to be here and enjoying it. Thank you. I love the camera, Alice, for dancing. <laughs> um, excited to join you all. I also spent last year being a researcher for the at uh, MIT Media Lab in the Space Exploration Initiative. And through that, I don't I don't have actually I have one uh, slide in here that goes into that, but um, with MIT Space Exploration Initiative and Afrotectopia we have uh, come together and are publishing a book, which I'm excited to launch soon. So, um, hello, my name is Adi, and I'm gonna talk a bit about generative AI and artistic practice, a practice my personal one. Um, I have a lot of slides here. I didn't mean to do that, but I, this is just a really exciting space for me. So um, it's gonna range a lot from my general framework about creating to the way that I'm thinking critically about AI, to the ways that I'm enjoying a bunch of creative possibilities with uh, the generative tool. So what I actually realized um, over the course of just like subconsciously, what I realized uh, exists is Um, and these are all quotes from this book. 
that I have called the Book of Symbols. And so it like looks at things that exist in the world and then it has a sort of way of thinking about it spiritually. Like how does it, how is it a uh, sort of like existential manifestation of it? So with ant, some quotes that it has is since antiquity, artists have chosen the ant to convey the virtue of industry at physical, psychological, and spiritual levels. Another quote is tiny ants embody the methodical discriminating work that helps the psyche or soul to sort the seeds of her relationship to the divine. And so as I reflected on those quotes, but also just my general fascination with ants and the ways that they exist in this world, for me, I decided that ants symbolize this idea of community, of multitude, labor, of the micro. And they work together to achieve a larger task. The small becomes big. So I see that synonymous with the way that humans navigate the world generally. You, I think oftentimes, like with the midst of our ego, we can sometimes inflate our existence a bit at times and kind of have a higher level of presence, which I think is helpful and unhelpful at times. But I think especially when you travel, you realize how small you really are. And I think that's really important to remember that you're really just a ripple in the ocean. You're part of a much smaller, you're a, a small piece of part of a large picture. Um, and I think that can be really freeing to understand. So kind of like release a lot of the pressure that we might have about things that we want to accomplish in life and this and that. Just saying that you're just here to do something that could seem pretty insignificant, but it actually is very contributive to society. And also, as we build in our small little spaces, we come together with other quote unquote ants, and we're building these communities. So we all have our own ways of being, and they're very similar. The people inside of those communities are very similar to each other. Then there are the bees. So bees, the ancient Egyptians, the honeybee was the creature that transformed the warmth of the sun's rays into golden sweetness. A mere pound of honey requires about 25,000 trips between flower and hive and contains the essence of over 2 million flowers. So in reflecting about this, uh, these quotes, and also just my, again, general fascination with bees, I've seen bees to represent a sort of cross-pollination. They blend different things. And it's an alchemy transforming one entity to another. And so I, I feel that us as humans, we're bees. We're moving from our ant communities and synthesizing a lot of different information uh, in the form of a bee. We're, I live in New York and I'm in Brooklyn and oftentimes when I'm walking down the street, I might see close to 200 people in the span of a day. And just the way that I'm looking at them, admiring their outfits, their hairstyles, the way that they talk, things that they're talking about, all of that is infiltrating my conscious and impacts the way that I think and create. And then there are trees. So every sort of creature nestles in the tree sheltering, motherly branches, hides in her hollows, and is fed by her substance. The tree shows us how from a tiny bare seed of potential, the self can come into existence, centered and contained around, which occur incessant process of metabolism, multiplying, perishing, and self-renewal. And so in reflecting on these, of the tree being this, this inhabitants of life of all sorts of different lives from mushrooms if it's a decaying tree to birds if it's a tree with strong enough branches um, but then also how it uh, it started from something really small and a tree can exist for even a thousand years and become this huge thing so for me I found trees to be symbolic of possibility of life something coming to life something really small uh, and it exists because it exists for lifetimes. When we create work and it, we put it out into the world, these are works that could exist far beyond our existence or our physical existence. And it's a home to philosophical imaginings and beyond and a home to philosophical imaginings and my interpretation, but literally it's a home to birds and a bunch of different beings. So when we create something, other people are now engaging with it and they're locking in their own memories or their ways of seeing and it's a symbolic form for them. And so that then creates a sort of framework of the ant species and trees, how they all feed into each other. We start off as ants, we become part of these little small movements, we're micro, we do a lot of steady labor, but it eventually expands, becomes small to big, and we start becoming a part of different communities of different quote unquote ants. And then we move into being a, a bee. So now we're pollinating. We maybe we're part of uh, a French club in our high school, and now we are more interested in sneaker culture as we got to college, and we're kind of like bridging those together. And now we create this alchemy of something new because we've blended different experiences. And then it manifests as we start to turn that into something. When we think about our interests and we produce that into something, it manifests into this tree and it exists far beyond our, again, existence, physical existence. 
So then there's this process of shoulders, subjects, application sh experiences is what I found. So I was watching this video on Virgil Abloh and he had this whole way framework of how he wants to uh, present the artistic process and he calls it mentors. And I like to call it shoulders just because uh, mentors for me, I feel like these are people that you have actually engagement with. Shoulders are people that these are, these could be anything. These could be, you're standing on the shoulder of a book that you just read. You're standing on the shoulder of a poem or whatever. So I think it's really important to identify this idea of shoulders so to recognize that this is something that we're all doing. We're all standing on different people's shoulders. So your shoulders now go into the subjects, which is what you're creating. And this is you as a bee. If you're doing this, you're merging that. Eventually you turn it into an application. So maybe you want to create a store about uh, recycled jeans, like strike of plastic turning to jeans. And then you want to create experience. Well, how are people going to try on those jeans? And that all of those things become the tree. It's just merging into the next, but you start off as an ant and eventually you create this tree. So this is my art practice sans generative AI. And this is how it's all kind of infiltrated the way that I think. So as I mentioned, this is the book that, so these are pages from the book. Um, uh, when I mentioned previously of being a research affiliate at MIT Media Labs Space Exploration Initiative, um, which is a really exciting space. And they asked me to come in. And um, for me, it's always great to kind of just like bring in things I'm already doing into spaces that invite me in. So already creating Aftertopia, this is, I wanted to have like a more quiet period where I work closely with different artists that I already know and we can just build very intimately together. So for the span of a year, we researched uh, and built on top of a lot of the uh, SEI's research and space exploration. Uh, and we came together and thought of what is space travel to us as a collection of black artists, a collective of black artists. And if we apply our cultural lens, like what does it mean to us? And even outside of like the traditional idea of what cultural lens is, it doesn't even have to be race specific. And really none of us actually created something that was ex exactly race specific. It was just generally our interests and just being people with the experiences that we had. So my personal interest was and has been uh, and still is botany. I love plants. Um, I think they're just beautiful creatures. And I wanted to speculate on what plants might exist uh, like design speculative plants that would live, exist in uh, celestial spaces. And so I rendered, 3D rendered all of these. And it's crazy to look at, actually look at these now because I'm like generative AI, none of this stuff is impressive anymore. And like, I can create this stuff with gen AI, uh, generative AI. But um, at the time it was 3D rendering these images. And, um, and then what I love to do also is a, storm, a form of pseudoscience. And that'll actually, I'll elaborate a bit on that in later slides, but pseudoscience for me is, I love the idea of science and the practice of science of studying things. And I, I recognize science as a form of seeing a phenomenon happen and then work backwards to do a sort of storytelling of what makes that phenomenon real. Why did that happen? How does that impact us? And so that's what I was doing with this. The plants are a sort of phenomenon. And now I'm uh, annotating on images of the plants of this is how it might impact us. These are formulas of ways that they may exist in the being. And then also what you see in the bottom layers are a form of geomancy. So um, geomancy is something that I'm really interested in and in indigenous sort of divination practices. And so if anyone doesn't know what those are, it's generally when communities um, like the I Ching is a form of a divinational practice or a lot of African indigenous communities do it where it feels like it's kind of like placing things randomly together. Like you randomly come across this uh, mapping of arrangements and then you decipher meaning from that. And so that's what I was doing with this. The plants all have their own mappings. And so as you flip through the book of the pages of the plants, now you can decipher your own meaning and um, a message for you to carry with you as you go along. Uh, and I'm gonna move through these pretty quickly because there's just a lot that I wanna, so sorry if I'm talking fast, but another area that I was exploring or have been exploring is labor. Um, and I'm thinking about labor in ways where, I think traditionally we think about labor as, uh, or labor that's recognized in society as something that deserves financial pay. And so I think about things like, if I'm just hanging around with my friends, sitting around the dining table, talking about things that are really exciting and socially impactful or whatever, no one's getting paid for that, but we get paid for doing other things that society has deemed as worthy of pay. And so to so think about like what's transactional, what's worth of pay, what's not, um, I just generally think a lot about like, why do we live the way that we do? And so I also think about things like um, labor and how labor also can be a form of art. And I think a lot about just like, what is art and what does it mean for something to be art? So what would it mean if someone that 
spends their life as my grandma did cleaning houses and um, spend every day cleaning people's bathrooms or whatever it is. And that might feel like a laborious thing, but if we kind of flip that and recontextualize this idea of labor and just add pigments to the end of my grandma's brushes or whoever's cleaning, now it becomes a sort of art piece. Now that bathroom becomes an installation. And so for me, I think about that uh, as I creative, what I did was I just went to Home Depot, grabbed a whole bunch of different brushes that are all utilitarian, nothing for artistic purposes traditionally. And then I put my whole, I put a huge um, canvas on my roof and just splattered a whole bunch of paint. Sometimes I was dancing on top of it and walking with my feet, like bare feet was amazing. It was one of my favorite experiences creating and not thinking about anything other than experimenting. There was no purpose. I had no objective. I was just purely in flow and just having fun. And that was a really uh, impactful moment because I think oftentimes art and the way that we practice it very traditionally in this world, it's like, it can be a pretty stressful experience because you want a certain outcome. You want it to look a certain way or whatever. And for me, I felt the most peace when I wasn't concerned about how someone might receive it, how it might land, how it might look, but I just got into the moment and really just created and explored. Um, so it did a lot of different things simultaneously with this piece. Another thing that I've been doing in my studio a lot is, so another shoulder, the Matisse, uh, like setting different artists and thinking, okay, these are people that have had very different lives for me. They've lived in very different places and different time eras. What does it mean for me to do what they've done? And so Matisse has been someone that I've been studying a lot. And even if it's just a matter of, I'm just positioning myself in the same way that he did. I'm not trying to create work like he did. I'm just positioning it and kind of placing myself in his shoes. That's just a small experiment and seeing what happens. But then also I've been spending a lot of time diving deeper um, into another area that's very much built off of Matisse's work. So when Matisse was in his 80s, he started to do these cutouts. Um, this was towards the, the end of his life. Um, and so he's an older man. He, he doesn't have as much mobility and this is what he can do. And he's limited to paper, uh, scissors, and glue. And I thought that was such a fascinating practice. I think it's really important to limit your practice because it actually creates a lot of room for exploration. And so that's what I did for myself too. Of even though I'm, I'm younger and I can move around much easier, I still love the idea of just containing myself. And because I have such like confining limits, it's actually showing that there's so much room, like an expansive amount of room to explore. And so I've done that with doing my own paper cutouts and then um, doing a lot of different organic forms and just seeing how there's nothing, none of these look like the other. They all look very, um, like none of them are exactly the same. They all can look kind of similar, but even though I'm just using paper and, and scissors, they have an entirely different form. So this has just been a really fun exploration, just like philosophically um, empowering. Another thing is uh, strawberry sounds. As I mentioned, I love plants. So this one, my, my shoulders were, um, a few friends kept sending me these videos of these guys that were uh, capturing the data from their mushrooms and then turning it into sound because they knew I would love it and they were right. So I ended up doing something just like that where I went up to my garden because um, in the summers, I just love growing my own food and flowers and all of that. So I grabbed uh, a few of my strawberry leaves and I put some TENS pads on them. And then I was able to extract the electromagnetic waves from those plants and put it into my modular synthesizer. And so the energy from the plants is now going into my synthesizer and now I'm turning it into sounds. <laughs> Alice, your reactions are hilarious to me. <laughs> um, so now I'm turning them into sounds and it, I'm doing all sorts of things like making it rhythmic, making it percussive, whatever it is, but it's just being able to turn the energy of plants and, and plants I think about so often of a lot of indigenous communities, they think of plants, um, they think of the way that they've understood plants as because plants can actually communicate and they have a language. And we, we as humans, we can't, we don't understand it in the way that maybe they did in the past or the, the stories that they've told, but there is a language of uh, plants and they exuberate, they, you know, uh, release this sort of energy. So to manifest that into something that we can feel, even if it's intangible, feels, um, it's just a really exciting space to explore. And I continue to do that. So this one, I continue to explore a lot with sounds. This one is another project on modular synthesis um, that I did with a uh, school in California, uh, part of the Black Tronica class, King Brit. And so this one was, um, all I did was I hadn't, they just asked me to do this performance. So I was like, I haven't touched my modular synthesizer in a few months, um, but it's the summer, it's a nice day outside. I'm just gonna bring it up. And I just, started recording immediately as I'm like figuring out how do I use this again and I'm plugging things in and my mic all the sound is clipping because it's really windy and I forgot to like put a cover over it but all of that's included because it's like it's not about being perfect 
perfect and creating this polished thing. It's just, I just want to record the process and allow people to understand, okay, like I'm learning on the go and you're watching it all with me. And I don't think any of these things are mistakes. I think this is just things to look at. And so I'm bringing the sound, the module synthesizer in, but then I also have the environmental sound of just my block in bed -Stuy. And so people are honking, you might hear people on the street talking, but it's all part of it. And I think um, not like trying to create these barriers when we think of art really is just encompassing of everything around us. This is another project um, by, I, I was funded by the Onassis Foundation. They, they gave me 72 hours to create whatever I wanted to create. So at the time I was thinking a lot about um, environmentalism and uh, how the earth was breathing a lot better since we were not commu commuting as more because of the pandemic. Um, and so what I did was I just, uh, and before that I had actually already started grabbing screenshots from um, Google Maps and just places all over the world because I wasn't able to travel and I loved traveling. So I just wanted to be able to look at land and exotic places again. So that screenshot different places. And then uh, I was already playing around with the module synthesis. And so when Onassis asked me to do this, uh, I already had like these different ideas and I just, it was a matter of being the B, bring them together. And now I'm creating this web VR experience where I'm interested in sound. I'm turning the data from these different major cities, creating an algorithm where it converts their data into a way that I can control my module synthesizer. And then I'm using the sound from a module synthesizer and turning that into the soundscape. And then you can go to each city and listen to that soundscape and look at the land by the images that I grabbed from a while ago. Um, and this is the last project I'll share, pre-Gen AI. And this one was about um, healing modalities. So this was in the midst of, I think, 2020. There were so many protests in the streets and it was just like such a painful time. We have the pandemic. We also have such a surge of Black Lives Matter. Like it was just a really stressful moment. And so I was thinking of how can there be and the ways that we fight and think about epigenetics of like, this is something that's gonna be embedded in our DNA for a long time. And as, as important as it is to fight and be a, a martyr, I also think it's way, it's it, just as important to heal yourself and make sure that you're at peace no matter what is going on. So I created this space where I had already been studying psychogeography just as a hobby. And psychogeography is the study of the ways that the design of your environment impact your psychology. And so things from the, the those studies uh, reveal how when you have large ceilings in a space, you feel like you're in the midst of something great, which is why a lot of cathedrals or government offices have really traditionally had had really large ceilings or curves make you feel calmer. So when they are butchering animals, they actually prefer to take them into spaces that are not uh, have angular kind of structures, but more so that they can feel calm as they're you know, about to get moralized. Um, but like all the ways that psychogeography impacts us, I was thinking about that also studying sound and how there is a, in Eastern philosophies, there's a relationship between sound and elements of spirituality, like the chakras. So um, at different frequencies, those happen to different chakras, like the crown or third eye or throat. And so I would use those specific frequencies. And then also thinking about how in different Pan-African revolutions, the djembe drum has been really impactful. For one, it's been a tool of communication in Haiti with the revolution. People were able to communicate from long distances without their voice, but with the drum. Uh, but it's generally just this sort of like sonic symbolism of freedom and independence. And so I blended all of those together to create this environment. And you can access it. It's at metamorphosis.fm. It takes a little bit to load uh, just because the files are so big. But you can enter it. And then as you navigate this space, this web VR environment, you can listen to the sounds. They're all spatialized. And I embedded them inside of these different spheres. Uh, oh, and this is actually the last one. So, and, and it's also, these things don't have to be grand. Like a lot of times the way that I travel is I just go to, a, when I, whenever I go to a different city, like I went to Rio and Brazil uh, and then Barcelona last year. And when I'm there, I just grab a whole bunch of different vinyl from all over the place and then turn that into a mix when I get home. I just think about to study the sounds of the country and uh, what are they collecting? What do they value sonically um, has just been, and, and being a bee, a DJ is very much a bee. You're just blending all of these different sounds and patterns and rhythms. So then I started to get into uh, my art practice with generative AI. And so now traditionally the bees have been you or me, but now also I'm seeing that the bees are very much a sort of prompt engineering um, and the ways that we engage with doing generative AI. And I think there's a lot of angst right now, and I'm gonna go into a lot of the different angst that I'm finding, but this in this moment right here, it's about, um, there's just a sort of angst of what is being produced and if what you create with generative AI, like that image, if that's even art. Um, and I think right now people feel especially comfortable because it doesn't, it, it all kind of looks very similar, like what you produce out of Mid Journey, they all kind of have a similar 
look. So it doesn't, it's hard to tell what is someone's artistry. And I think as people really understand how to use the tools better, they're gonna say in the same way that we've navigated this world and been bees traditionally um, by synthesizing a bunch of different stuff and then bringing in your style and signature and culture and upbringing and ways of being and seeing, and then turning that into a form of energy. And then you, it radiates in the world when you manifest it as a tree. That's the same thing that's going to happen with generative AI is we just get to use the, the tools better. Um, so this is a funny tweet uh, that went viral and it says the hottest new programming language is English. And this is spot on. And this is why generative AI has become something that's so massive is because it, it's been around for a while. Like the, these technologies, the same technologies have existed at least a year and a half before the bust in um, 2022. And even in 2014, we were doing GANs and it was, it, it was all just because you had to code and you had to be a programmer and all these other things. And it's just like, it was really limiting. And so once you open it up and let people, all sorts of people bring it in and not have to know the, the technical frameworks for it, this is when it becomes something that's way more approachable and, and actually way more impactful. Um, and so now we're in this midst of this text to text so we can interact with chatbots. And I've talked to ChatGPT for too long and have just made it my best friend of like, it's encouraging me with all my ideas and being so supportive. So there's like this uh, emotional aspect of chatbots now and even with copyright. And you could say, I'm turn my uh, bio into something that's an artist statement, or you could do text to images. I'll go into text to video is very shortly on its way. It's already, there are already prototypes internally at a lot of different big tech companies, but externally it's it's like probably days, weeks, months. Text to sound, which already even exists. Um, I use a lot of things like Refusion, so I can blend different genres together, just describe sounds and it'll create that 3D render. You can do text to 3D render, 3D movement, et cetera. But all of that comes down to language. And so this is what I've been thinking a lot about, just like, I think we're all getting really excited and that's great, but it's also just like, it's really important to kind of take a step back and be critical of what is actually happening. So if all of this is embedded inside of language and if language impacts the ways that we think and the ways that we are and exist in this world, um, and language is also just so much of a root of culture and the way that we've been trained to think, and language also is embedded in psychology and perception, expression, and it, like, all of these things are rooted inside of language or language and all of them are inexchangeable. Um, and so to think about that, like identity and what is valued, um, it's a bit worrisome because this is what all this is built off of. And this is an image of the clip model. So clip model is basically what made this text to image and text to content exist. It's It decided to scrape images of their metadata uh, of like, how are they tagged? verbally or um, wor with words, uh, literally, and it uh, has a relationship between them and then it creates that, embeds that into latent space. And so now if you say a word, if you write down a word, it's gonna scrape and find what are images that have used that word and I'm gonna create images that look like the word that you have used. And so this is also being developed hyper-locally in the US. And so to think about the U.S. being the ones that are creating such an immensely and powerful technology, and then we think about it's not even just the U.S., but it's the tech labor force, and then it's not even just this tech labor force with 60% white people, but the, these demographics are just people that are employed by the companies. It's not even people that are actually touching the technology, which is often drastically different from these demographics. So it's a really just such a specific group of people that are deciding this is the way that we value things. These are our languages. This is our identity. This is how we symbolize stuff. What does that mean when we're creating with a tool with such a specific people and they are, and, it, and it's a culture that just attempts to be so universal, um, but it's not. So we also can't even question it because we don't even have alternatives of ways of thinking. And so these diagrams are something that are really important to me. They're um, by Marimba Ani, who has written the book Yurugu. And the Yurugu is a book about studying European culture, but through an African lens. And I think this is just like an amazing book and just practice and it literally subverses the practice of anthropology and it creates an alternative framework of we're so embedded in this idea of what logic is supposed to be which is like completely negating spiritual being or meaningfulness or interconnecting context and so that's what we embed our values and that's the chart on the left or this idea of our ideologies that are embedded in the side of western framework it's really just a mythology like these are truths that exist to a small, small group of people but it's proliferated worldwide and it's just people's opinions, but now we have designed, designed our whole society around that. So 
I've just been studying this a lot and thinking about well, what is it, what culture do I even exist in? Like, what does it mean? How am I engaging? And, and what are ways that I can think critically about this? Um, I'm going to skip over these quotes just for sake of time. But um, this has encouraged me to get into this idea of computational anthropology. So with computational anthropology, the way that I've defined it, it's a word that existed before, but the way that I'm using it um, is in my own way, which is how does the machine, which I use synonymously for AI, computation, online society, et cetera, see us based on how we presented ourselves and designed it to see us. Um, what can we learn from our metadata? So how have we fed our existence into the machine? So I'm with a bunch of different stuff. And so now how is that machine reflecting us? It's telling us about ourselves. So what I started to do was go into the public domain archive, um, archived images from the public domain, and I would grab the way that they captioned the different images and I would use simply those as prompts inside of Stable Diffusion. Stable Diffusion is one of the generative AI tools. And so what Stable Diffusion then would spit out a bunch of images trying to visualize the prompt that I gave it. And so these are these images, which was just like mind blowing to me. Um, the top left in the center one, the top right is the actual, the real Benjamin Pat. And so what it would then do is create these other Benjamin Paps. And uh, it was consistent in their hair, facial hair, and the way that they were presented and the, even the type of camera and like the distortion. Um, but it was not consistent in the race, which was really interesting. Or even in other moments like the African girl of Tanzania, very consistent of the way that she would have looked. Uh, I can't even remember which one is the real, oh, the real one is the one in the bottom left. The only way that I can tell which ones are the real ones are because the dimensions, I didn't change the dimensions of my original one. So you can see the differences in the image. But the fact that it was able to render it so similarly to the original image, just off that little context. And so then I started to add a bit more context. So not just using the ways that I've captured the image, but adding some additional information like maybe uh, in National Geographic or by African photographers or in a Red Cross pamphlet or by white photographers or a United Nations pamphlet. And to see the way that it would render when I would use certain organizations, how maybe those organizations have a pattern of kind of like romanticizing uh, an environment like National Geographic, you would, it would add this haze. Um, and then if it was based off the race, I would find if I said by African photographers, you would see the face of the subjects usually, like they would be turned towards the camera, but if it was by a white photographer, you would see the back of their heads, or sometimes you wouldn't even see subjects at all. And for me, that was a reflection of uh, voyeurism in a way where people that are not part of the community enter another part of the community, and there is not that trust there with the subject and the photographer. Um, and that's just a theory. I have to do a lot more research and exploring that, but it seemed to be a really significant come out. And so then what I also started to do was upload my own image. And I was really skeptical about this. Um, it felt more comfortable to do what I was doing before, but when I got into the photorealism part of generative AI, I was really worried just because there are so many ways that this could just be harmful. And I'll go into it a little bit more, but um, the identity, like identity is really a protected space. And so to see tools that can easily render your identity however it wants to is scary. Um, so what I would do is, I wasn't thinking too much of the scared part. I was just interested in seeing what would happen. And so I uploaded my own image and then I would also just add additional context of a person. So these are people that have a huge corpus of identity like embedded in them. Um, and so the way that it would understand Michelle Obama and overlay her way of being on top of me of adding a lot more makeup, making me smile and but consist can keeping my clothing and the way that I position myself. So just to study, what did it keep? And what did it change? based on how they identify these people to be and who would smile and who would look away at the camera, who would look directly at the camera, who would be very serious like Angela Davis or who would kind of like have a, a smirk or I don't know, like how would they, how would it understand the way that we exist in this world? And then to even go on a smaller scale of um, altering the image based off of adjectives um, and not like a person, but just keep my image and just adding things like uh, mom or black or fashionable or poor or Nigerian, some attributes I have, some I don't. Um, and to see the way that it would assume that this is how I must look if I have those attributes, um, which is really interesting. Like an Afro-Latina, I'm, I'm an Afro-Latina, but I have to have a lot of makeup on to be an Afro-Latina, or I'm, a, I'm also a programmer, but I got to be a white guy to be a programmer, or uh, I'm also an aunt, but I'm not as that same age as that aunt. So it's like the ways that it understands who we are. Um, and it's not really for me, it's something to take offense to or like to be upset about. It's simply, this is a reflection of the society. Like this is how we present ourselves to the internet. This is the corpus of image and language that it has to, to work with. 
but it also it like emphasizes how it's not a matter of us funneling everything into these like small companies that are big companies that are trying to scrape all of the world's data. Uh, these companies are going to be very specific to small cultures that are not global. Um, no, no culture should be global. It's really what I uh, think. And so then I turned all that research into um, an essay, which you can find. I can also share it in the chat uh, on computation anthropology and exploring identity through artificial synthesis. And um, so I had my critical moments of it, but then I started to have a lot of fun. And I turned myself into this like supermodel that was traveling all around the world and photo shoots in Egypt and on the yacht and shipping champagne. And it was like a complete artificial flex. And I ended up turning my entire social media existence into this supermodel influencer who just like has all these amazing images of herself and just watched how my friends and people I didn't know reacted to it. And people were excited and I was like, I expected some people to be upset. They didn't verb, they didn't come to me and tell me that. But just the fact that we're here in this moment, this was before Lenza. This was like some of people's first moments of seeing AI on an identity and me being morphed into all these different ways. So I was having too much fun. I mission accomplished. I became Beyonce for a good week and life was good. Um, and then I was also uh, bending my identity. And I think this was like one of the more fascinating moments of, as someone I realized, oh, I'm actually really rigid in the way that I presented myself into the world. And I really care about like how people perceive me. And what if I like blow all that up and I start posing in ways I never would have in front of a camera and I'm wearing things I never would have. And what does that mean? And then I started to think about how, oh, identity is really just this performance that exists on the external world. And actually internally, none of these things are jarring to me internally. Like I could see myself doing this, but externally, I would never present myself like this to my friends. So that bending of identity, which felt actually really liberating, um, was exciting. And so I started to get this new mode of art making of now I'm able to prompt engineering is a form of art making, like it's a way of creating, especially when you think about it in such an intricate way of now it's the people that have existed in this world and have studied art and design, society and psychology and have words to put together to create things like this. They have a place to exist in ways that programmers don't. Like I would talk to, as I'm building this internally in big tech, they are completely uncomfortable with this. They have no idea how to use it. So like this is creating a whole new lane for people, which is exciting. It's me understanding myself differently, my understanding my identity, um, seeing new possibilities, like actually literally being able to create visuals of worlds I never would have imagined. Again, as I mentioned, I turned my whole social media presence into my artificial images. Uh, as someone that has loved photography, um, I thought about photography very critically in this moment, and I'm actually bringing all this into a class at NYU called Computational Photography with AI, where we're working with students of this exists, you all are prolific photographers already, but what might you do in this space? Um, and so I was thinking about it of when would I actually use a camera and when wouldn't I? And like when I went to Rio de Janeiro, I didn't even use my camera. I was intentional about, you know what, I actually want to practice not capturing everything as I usually do, because there's this whole tool that can do that if I wanted to. And what does it mean to like exist in this world like very presently? Um, but then also when would I want to use a camera? And if I'm taking a picture of my family doing something that I like have a lot of emotional connection to, I need the camera for that. So there are different uses now for the camera. But then on the flip side, and this was also, the, these are concerns that I had since forever, um, like as I got introduced to this whole space is, the concerns, like the ethical concerns, what does it mean for privacy? Society is already on such a fragile thread. What does it mean for now anyone to be able to render some politician doing something very skeptical and say that it's true and put it at a poster in the middle of America where people don't even know about these kind of things even existing. So misinformation or involuntary identity bending. What if someone had a, a boyfriend who just hates them now and now they're turning their images into all these ways that they never would have wanted or the racial, ethnic, cultural, gender nuances. Like, what does it mean? I had a whole AI party in my artist studio um, and brought a bunch of like, we had 10 black women, all of us were playing around with these tools and so many offensive things were coming up for them, just automatically assuming that they must have tattoos or, and that's not offensive, but just like just assuming and imposing all these ways of being that they didn't have, that, that wasn't even the way that they existed. And the protection of artists, uh, artists and their crafts, which is huge. Like people are thinking a lot about this and, and there's a lot of angst around this. So just like, what does it mean to now enter the, the art world and stickiness? And I'll go into each of these. For one, the misinformation and I can bucket all of these together. This is the most urgent area for me of like, what does this mean and, and what should people be working on and, the, and what should big tech be working on? And generally it's 
uh, even the government, like who should be, this is a space that needs to be a lot more fleshed out and the synthetic media detection. And this was started with deep fakes, but we have gone and such, it's just an exponential rise as far as who can create synthetic media. So being able to detect what is real and what's not is just, is just like number one. Safeguards to mitigate production of sensitive content. And this is happening in a lot of different tools, like they'll block it if you, they think you're trying to do something nude, but continuing to do that. Uh, and inclusive data sets is kind of a hairy one for me because in the same way that I think these bigger companies should be, uh, of course, inclusive of data and work to develop data sets that are a lot better than the tools that we have now. Like a lot of them are building off of Leon, L-A-I-O-N as a model set, which has scraped the whole internet. But clearly the internet is of a Western world, hyper-specific to the States mostly. And um, it's just like, it's a certain group of people. So clearly that's not inclusive and I, that needs work. But I also think this is a moment where it's hairy in a positive way where um, I think people of different communities, this is a space where different communities can exist and it doesn't have to be, we're all funneling to make these big tech companies powerful and universal, but you as your smaller community can create your own tool. You can create, as an Asian community, you can create your own tool of maybe you're uh, in, in Indonesia and you want to create tools that are rendering images very specific to Indonesian cultural nuances, have your own tool, let people that want to tap into that world be able to do it and the Indonesian community gets to be financially empowered. Why is it all going to these bigger companies? Like this is a moment where things can really shift. Um, and big tech generally is too rewarded by capital gain without enough consequences to the contribution of harm. So a lot of values even that have existed in some big tech companies is just being kind of like dispersed because it's just such an urgency right now. Um, the protection of artists' crafts and their crafts I think every revolution brings discomfort. So a lot of people are worried about what does this mean for my artistic practice? This has always happened. Recorded music was a huge moment when we could no longer, you didn't have to go to a concert, but now you, had to, uh, now you could listen to it in your living room. Samplers, when you could grab other people's music, which is basically what's going on right now. Um, and I think also a huge tension is the fact that someone else is making money off the cards, crafts. And I think this is like the biggest one is just now all these companies can now use my style and make money off that. I think that's, it's not even like the technology alone, it's the fact that other people are doing it. I think um, a big thing that needs to happen is just a reflection on how artificial synthesis is also really just a human practice. It's just computational. So a lot of artists, they think that they have this sort of like individual ownership over their craft and like creativity is in relation to individual ownership. And it's not, as I just mentioned, we're bees. So we're bringing together a bunch of different stuff all the time. So there's really no idea of individual ownership. And what this is doing is basically just replicating it but on a computational scale. Um, so I think there's just like has to be a little bit of grace there. There is um, a level of reevaluating our metrics. So for the value of art, traditionally, we think the metric is, oh, you spent 10 hours in your studio creating this painting. So it must be something that's prolific versus you did, you spent a minute creating this prompt and you created this amazing image, but it's not reflective of the fact that people that are creating these great prompts have also spent a lifetime studying art, studying design, culture, psychology, and they're able to bridge all of that and create these prompts. So I think it's just like a whole different way of evaluating. I don't think we even know what art is actually. I mean, again, like back to the culture and the way that we identified what art means in this world. I think if you're so like, I think this is actually a moment where artists, like artists, artists are saying, oh, this is a new tool. And art is all about just like exploring and experimenting and getting new things. So it's never about holding so tightly onto things. Um, and these are merely tools and vehicles. It's not a replacement for boundary pushing creativity. It can only replicate what's already been done. So for the things that have already been done, like certain forms of copywriting or image making, yeah, it's going to be able to replace that. But for the artistry that is like blended, boundary pushing and pushing to new levels, um, this is what it, it can't get in and do that. Um, and just like the stickiness of it, like it's clearly this is disruptive economically, massively economically disruptive. Everyone's just running in a rush and moving crazy because it doesn't take much to build something that's really impactful with this sort of AI. Um, but I think also what's happening is people have to shift from thinking about fancy technology, which most people just don't care about. And understanding that it's about culture, art, and style, and that's a huge opportunity oversight, and that's what people actually care. It's not about if something is using AI, it's what is it actually doing. So uh, very quickly, I'm just going to go on. I know I'm like running, but um, these are just ways that I've, okay, cool. These are just ways that I've been blending it with my own artistic practice of I'm in the studio all the time. I'm creating my own work with paper. I said, this is the Matisse like Adi versus Matisse kind of thing that I'm exploring. So I'm using the organic forms from that. And then I'm thinking, okay, what, do, what if I turn that into something as my, and I scan images of those 
and then upload it as my foundational model for generative AI. So I started off in the top one with what if it's a pneumatic sculpture, a pneumatic, uh, I don't know, like arrangement. And so it does that. And then I'm like, okay, well, what about if I turn that into sneaker culture? Like, what if I make some Air Jordans? And then it does that. And I'm like, okay, well, what if I add some like Converse and make it maybe if it's like a like fashionable shoe and it adds like a, a high top. And then, okay, what if I go back to it? So it's like all these playing and I'm just prompting with my own images and making it into something else. And I think um, this is also where it's like this fascinating. And even as I created some images, like I've created images of people, I now wanna turn those images into painting. So there's like this bouncing back and forth of this is my own style right now and I'm putting it in and now it's influencing the things that are being created. And this is not something I can really prompt as easily. So it's not even just a matter of it's prompt as AI, it's everything that goes into it. It's the models, it's your input, it's the way that you're styling it, all of that. And then I'm continuing to push it. So what if I do AI and footwear, but now fashion? Like what if I add language that's beyond footwear and it turns it into like these coats, like a puffer jacket with some biomorphic uh, exterior on top of it? Or what if I do it into industrial design? So this is all just like the same model that I start off with of continuing the sneaker form, but extrapolating it and now turning it into a lamp or a sink faucet or like all these other things. Or what if I just explore with fashion? Generally, I've been thinking a lot about fashion. This could be a huge moment for the fashion world to reimagine their archive. Big design houses can look at what they were creating in the 70s and now bring new life to it. And so I would do things like say, uh, something from the 1980s, uh, Nebraska, like literally just right Nebraska and then like street style. And now it gave me the, the top left of like now cowboy hats are kind of a thing. Or I love the actual cargo shorts. I would love to wear those. It was like these pleated, like um, flared cargo shorts um, or even creating these. And this is all just like play. There's no meaning for me with this stuff specifically. It's just, what if I just created images and now I create this speculative mu music magazine spread? And what, what does that mean? I'm, I'm creating these music artists and what kind of music might they create? Or what I've been doing, even this, this is all just from today. So what I was thinking about is AI and architecture of, what if I um, bring in images from prolific spaces, music venues around the world, and then just like bring other life to them. So the middle one is actually from a gym. It was like a high school gym and just adding all this prompt to it, it turned into this surreal psychedelic space or all these other spaces. Um, and so then what I started to do, and I'll wrap it up here is, then I also found this tool where I can turn my image and use it as a tool of reverberation onto the sound. So AI is just like, it's pushing things like crazy. So what I would do is I would upload this image and I also upload a sound and this is the original sound. Then I say, okay, now change that sound based off the image. So what it does is it studies the image it finds out where are the endpoints of the image, like it does the whole spatialization of it. And then it will space, it will reverberate this, it'll add reverb to the sound based off of how it imagines existing in the space. So if you can hear a little bit of like that, it's kind of hard to hear and hear probably, but just like that echo, more, more of an echo in the reverberation. And I also did with here, but um, it, it's probably hard to hear the nuance of it. So, Future areas that I hope to explore, continue in furniture design and architecture and sound and genre morphing, like especially with all this text to sound, scientific explorations, speculative futures, like we can create these other worlds, but also speculative histories, like what does it mean for mod like society in ways we've never even imagined? Um, new forms of cinema, I'm also a DJ, so now I can create visuals for my DJ sets and create this whole audio visual experience. So I'll wrap up there and you can find some more of the work um, here at Alexiano TV. Wow, everyone, please give a big applause. You can also, if you don't want to unmute, there's like, yeah, I, there's like this little emoji you can click. Whoa. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. thank you, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> this was so impressive, this talk, wow. Uh, I had so many questions that then you answered like a minute later. It was so good. <laughs> it was like, how would it be? And then you already answered it. Um, we have we have like five minutes for for um, uh, Q and A, but like I, I just want to say thank you for for this. It was really really so many interesting interesting takes and like research. I think one question that is maybe more of an open question is um, you are already like a really interdisciplinary maker, like also being a DJ and a researcher and like doing stuff with code, but also different mediums. 
what role do you think this new way of making you discovered with generative AI will take in that? Like, how will you like sometimes not make anything at all, or will it be like a larger theme in the projects that you'll do from now on? Yeah, it's I hard to say, it. but yeah, it's hard to say right now. I think for me, I just love the relationship of I really want it. Like as I left uh working full-time and wanted to spend more time in my studio I didn't want to look at a screen but this past week I've looked at a screen for like four days straight so that's the worst <laughs> part of this and I'm like I can't wait when it becomes a moment where it's no longer I need to look at a screen to do all this generative high stuff um mm. but I love the just bouncing I'm creating something with paper and then I get to put it in and maybe I turn it into an art style of now I get to render some drawing based off that style and I didn't actually do it so it's like for me it's really just kind of like it's mushy it's very playful so I'm not yeah. sure yeah it's a really cool to see that actually this kind of way of making of combining different techniques really seems to like naturally translate into this yeah. generative AI as an extra medium yeah. with your work, which is really cool. I really also loved um, the the things you said about uh, computational anthropology. I thought that was super, uh, super inspiring and like a really valuable way of making. And this is kind of an open question. I don't know if you I don't expect anyone to have an answer for this, but um, I'm wondering like what ways of making, or like what ways could, if there are ways in which artists and makers uh, can help uh, or encourage the shift of power. So the thing you mentioned with like, actually like this whole new generative AI field has so much potential for like empowering different communities. Like this is just an open question. Like yeah. how can makers help with that? Yeah, I mean, I think like I even saw this post of I think it was like in Kenya or somewhere on the African continent of they have the largest library of images that uh, like data set of images that had never exist doesn't exist anywhere else. I think it's like almost where okay, who on in that country can now scan all of those images, turn that into a model, and if anyone wants to use images that would be somewhere relation in relation to that culture that money is not going directly to these people and they're tapping into a tool that they built, they understand their nuances. I think it's just a lot to expect for these small, like these few companies to be able to scrape the whole world and do it in a decent job. And I think it's like, it, it, it's economically for one, it's so much more empowering when it's like spread out, but also just mm -hmm. nuance and um, cultural understanding. So for me, I'm excited about that, but also artistically, I think even with the tools that do have, that exist, um, for artists, this is also a moment where it can be like, get familiar. I know a lot of people are kind of staying away from this. They want to stay analog or whatever it is, but, uh, and they're just fearful of their jobs, which I get, and it's very valid, but even people that used to create posters by paper, and now they're in Photoshop, like this stuff is always happening. And it's really a matter of staying with the times if you want to keep moving forward in, in this way. And so, um, I think with that, it's also, this could be a moment where artists realize, oh, I, I seem to have a style that people really want to use. I can now uh, find a tool that will, uh, like tools should be developing ways where artists can now get financially incentivized if someone wants to use your tool, a royalty fee. If someone uses Lorna Simpson's name in their prompt, Lorna Simpson better be getting some money from whoever is putting <laughs> that tool. So I think, but also artists could start creating styles that would now be something that could be impactful, like, or even prompt styles, prompts are now IP. So now you can capitalize off that. I think there are, there's a lot of spaces where people can think of themselves as being empowered in this way. Yeah, thank you. Um, there were a few questions in the chat. Um, I think one a very short one was, how do you get in a situation where uh, NASA wants you to create a project with them? Uh, for 72 hours, so it was by Nala. Oh, oh, NASA, <laughs> not NASA. <laughs> oh, NASA, sorry. Yeah, NASA. oh, NASA. It's oh, NASA. Yes, they're a foundation in, in Greece. Oh, I think I wish NASA. NASA. <laughs> yeah. uh, I also heard NASA, but I, I think that's still the same question. Like, um, that sounded really cool and amazing. Yeah. So just do something for 72 hours. Um, <laughs> And then another question, or it was more an open thing. So um, also because I really liked the tweet to show like the hottest new programming language is English. And um, I also wonder like, uh, there was uh, Gorkan said like, oh, but then other languages are actually discriminated. And I, I was also wondering like, uh, what your thoughts were on that? Because like, uh, of course, all the, the prompting that's happening now with generative AI is, in English because it's in the US. Like, um, yeah, um, 
would it you know would it make sense to translate or like to find a way to use other languages um, yeah i think that, that even goes to just like does it have to i mean the you can already use the big tools to I, i've used other languages i've used a bunch of different languages and it still renders and the interesting thing about that is specifically with stable diffusion the language that i use it will then bring in that's the cultural style of that language and overlay on top of the image so it can be a place mm. to explore it's really not exclusive to english it's definitely a lot more prolific in english just because that's a larger percentage of the corpus that it's trained on top of but again like this is like this could be if, if someone wants to create something that's in the spanish language it could be people that are of spanish descent like uh from spain or uh, latinos from the caribbean or wherever and you create your own um tool with your language yeah Thank you so much. It's so inspiring and uh, really, really nice to have you. Um, I think we're we're it's already one, um, but I'm really happy. Yeah, I'm really happy. This was a really inspiring talk. Uh, the chat is like full with people that say they're floored and they're so happy that they were here. So thank you so much, Ari, and um, uh, thank you everyone that joined and. Um, have a nice day and um, hopefully we'll see you next week uh, where we have Sebastian Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>